Now let's construct the genetic model that explains the variation of quantitative traits. Um, this is going to be super simple in this presentation, but don't be worried by its childish appearance. Um, it remains, as far as we know, um, a very true to the um, underlying reality in all its gory complexity. The idea is that uh, genetically there are a number of independent loci in the genome that have what can be called plus and minus alleles. These are alleles that tend to increase the trait value on our scale of measurement or decrease it. Assume each individual's trait value then is just the sum of its plus alleles at all loci. You could also say it's the sum of the minus alleles, but then you would just be measuring in minus units of the trait. So it really doesn't matter. That is, we're assuming a plus allele at locus A, let's call it, will have the same effect, or at least the same kind of effect, as a plus allele at locus B. That's the key idea. That's what's new and probably new to you if you haven't studied this subject before, which you probably haven't. It then follows on just that simple assumption that we have a bunch of loci, all of which have alleles that can make equivalent substitutable contributions to the trait value. With random mating, we will then get a quasi-binomial distribution if the number of x's carried by, sorry, the number of pluses, number of plus making alleles, also, of course, the a binomial distribution of the number of minus making alleles. And those will end up looking extremely normal as the number of loci increases. And that's all there is to it. If there are a lot of loci, each with plus and minus alleles, contributing to the trait value in the limit of lots of such loci, um, we're going to get a smooth, close to normal type distribution. All right, and so let's build this up um, from the simplest possible case, that of the special case, where in fact there's only one locus, let's call it A. And this, these figures are based on a famous experiment that was actually done slightly more than 100 years ago by Edward East on the heights of flowers, um, or corallas, sometimes the trait is called corolla height or flower height, um, in a uh, population of tobacco plants that he was studying in, I believe it was, North Carolina. All right, so he had a pure breeding short flowered line and a pure breeding tall flowered line. Um, tobacco does happily inbreed, so it's possible um, to get them to be quite homozygous. All right, so let's imagine that the short flowered line is short because it's homozygous for the little a allele at the flower height locus, and the tall ones are homozygous for the big A tall making allele at the same locus. East crossed the two lines to make F1 hybrids. They would then have had one short parent, one tall parent, and so they would have been heterozygotes, little a, big A, or big A, little a, and they would have had intermediate height flowers. That's the key idea. All right, so two um, little a's gives you a short flower. Um, one little a and one big A gives you an intermediate flower. Um, two big A's gives you a taller flower. Then East crossed the F1s among themselves. Mendel does Mendel's job, and outcomes are one to two to one distribution of genotypes. And look what we've got, a one to two to one distribution of flower heights as well. And I hope you're now ready to notice that that already has a kind of normal uh, look to it. It's a, a humped uh, single um, unimodal distribution. Okay, so now let's add a second locus, call it B for convenience, and let assume that the short flowered um, strain uh, or inbred line family is homozygous for little a and little b, both of which are short making, and conversely the tall flowered line 
is homozygous for the big, the capital letter allele at both the A and B loci. Okay, so it has four tall making alleles. Um, the F1 hybrids will then be doubled heterozygotes. They'll have two short making alleles, little a and little b, two tall making alleles, big A and big B. They'll be of intermediate height, just as they really were. Then East crosses them among themselves, and out comes this um, more complicated distribution with five different categories of number of tall making alleles. Um, the shortest um, will be little a, little a, little b, little b, just like the short parent. Conversely, big A, big A, big B, big B will be the tallest, just like the original tall parent. And in between, we will have um, uh, those with one tall making allele, let's say one big A or one big B, and this is the key idea, either of these um, gets an equivalent um, slight boost in flower length, and at the high end, um, genotypes with three capital letter alleles, um, perhaps um, two big A's and one big B, or um, two big B's and one big A, um, they're sort of short-ish and tall-ish, and then um, several, actually three different ways of getting um, two and two of the short making and the tall making alleles. And this is the key idea. Notice little a, little a, big B, big B is phenotypically the same, or at least similar, to big A, big A, little b, little b, or little a, big A, little b, big b. Any of those ways of doing it gets you two short making and two tall making alleles, and you will come out with a middling flower height. Now you see where this is going. This figure, by the way, is also from Heron and Freeman. Um, so let's jump to six loci, call them A through F, and play the same game. And now in the F2s, you get this distribution that has very many um, different categories of numbers of tall making and short making alleles, and its shape is now um, indistinguishable from that of a normal distribution. So there we are. We've got a genetic model for getting normally distributed traits just from the segregation of plus making and minus making alleles at even a handful of loci. Okay. So there's just one more element um, to add, and that's the effect of the environment, which we didn't mention in that previous development of the polygenic model, which is what the previous slide was the picture of. So here's the big idea in quantitative trait biology, or quantitative genetics, as it's sometimes called. The total phenotypic variance can be decomposed into two parts, one called the genetic variance, because it's the variation in the trait caused by differences of genotypes, as in our model for the tobacco plants a moment ago. And the other part is the environmental variance, which is the variance of the phenotypes that is attributable to variable, often effectively random, effects of the environment, which is to say of experiences that individuals have while they are developing the trait. So on this um, big idea, which is one of the great intellectual triumphs of our species, I would say, um, and due in its modern form to um, the great R.A. Fisher, the statistician, who published it in a paper just over 100 years ago when he was 28 years of age. Um, what you see, he realized and taught us, is what you get from these two distinct sources of variation, and they can be separated in a really beautiful analysis, which gives us the analysis of variance, a term you may have heard. Okay. So what is this genetic variance? I'll, let's say it again, slightly more carefully. It's the variance among the phenotypes. It's not the variance among genes. It's the variance of the phenotypes, which is caused by 
genotypic differences among the individuals. And conceptually, it's the part that we would get if we could hold those individuals' environments constant. That is, if we could eliminate the variable effects of the environment, the variance we would see would be just the part that's caused by genes. Conversely and symmetrically, the environmental variance is the variance not of the environment itself, but it's the variance among the phenotypes, which is caused by differences in the experiences of individuals, conceptually holding genotypes constant. Okay, so it's the variance we would get even if everybody had exactly the same genotype with respect to all variation that can affect our trait of interest. So here's an example, a little model that's the best I've been ever able to come up with um, to help you see concretely how these two sources of variance add on top of each other to give us the total phenotypic variance. And that was R.A. Fisher's great insight, is that it's not just metaphorically that these two variance components contribute or add up to, it turns out it's actually mathematically exact that they do and must. Okay, so let's go with this simplest of all models involving just one locus again. The average trait values of big A, big A, big A, little a, and little a, little a individuals are, we imagine, minus one, zero, and plus one units of whatever they are, millimeters if you like. And our allele frequencies um, will be P and Q equals a half. Okay, so we have equal numbers of big, big A and little a alleles in the population. And um, the, the three um, genotypes produce um, these um, phenotypic uh, proportions um, or values, minus one, zero, and plus one. Okay, then um, the genetic variance, the average squared deviation from the population mean, will be 0.5. That's only true, of course, under these assumptions, that the genetic effects are to move the phenotype on average down one unit or up one unit, and um, that the alleles are equally frequent. So we have 25%, 50%, and 25% of the three genotypes. Okay, but on that assumption, then, the genetic variance um, will be a half. That's because um, half of the individuals are one unit away from the mean, which is zero. Okay, the other half of the individuals are no distance from the mean, so they contribute nothing. And so um, half of one squared, which is the squared deviation, is a half. Right? That's where the genetic variance of a half comes from. Okay. So now let's introduce and layer on top this environmental variance. And we're, to be simple, um, mathematically, we're going to um, make a, a similar assumption about the effect of the environment. It causes a quarter, the environment does, it causes a quarter of each genotype, regardless of what genotype it is, to develop a phenotype that deviates one unit above or below its average trait value. So that's what's shown here in this um, little distribution labeled V sub E for the environmental variance and boxed for the moment and shown as coming from the big A, big A genotypic class whose mean is minus one unit, okay? But after the environment gets in there and messes with these individuals during their development, a quarter of them are bumped down to a phenotype of minus two. A quarter of them are bumped up to a, a phenotype of zero. Remember, the average for big A, big A is minus one. Okay, so a quarter of them get back up to the population mean, and half of them are not affected. Half of them remain unchanged, and they develop their expected phenotype, which was minus one. Okay, that's the environmental effect applied to the big A, big A um, genotypes. Okay, as you can see, right, this one to two to one um, 
type um, distribution um, pr produces the same variance of environmental effects, which is also, as it happens, for convenience, a half. It's just the same as this distribution, but shorter. Okay, so the resulting phenotypic variance, once we've applied this environmental smearing process to the development of everyone in the population, the heterozygotes and the little a, little a homozygotes as well, um, we're going to get a phenotypic variance that's the sum of this genetic variance contribution, whose val value magnitude is 0.5, and the environmental variance component, whose magnitude is 0.5. Add those two, says Fisher, and um, the resulting total variance of 1.0 will be what you see among the individuals in the population. And sure enough, if you do this, apply this smearing effect to all three of the genotypes and add up the results. This is the distribution you get, V sub B, P, for the variance of the phenotypes. Um, you get, um, what is it, a sixteenth of minus two, a sixteenth of plus two, and then uh, these other proportions in between. I think it's a quarter and three eighths. And um, it has a mean of zero and a variance of exactly one. So this is the formalism that um, Fisher tumbled to as a young man. Right, VP, the total phenotypic variance, um, can be decomposed into these two pieces, V sub G, the genetically caused variation or variance, um, V sub E, the environmentally caused variance, and those add together um, to as we say, to the total. Um, each of them, each of those components, the genetic overall and environmental, can themselves be further subdivided. Um, and industrial strength quantitative genetics spends a lot of time doing that, often for economic reasons. Um, but um, it's important um, for us to distinguish among these three uh, major components of the genetic or genotypic variants, which are V sub A, the additive component, V sub B, D, the dominance component, which comes from the dominance interactions of genetic foci at which there are dominant and recessive alleles, and V sub I, the interaction variants, which uh, comes from the epistatic interactions between genotypes at different loci in the genotype. Um, the environmental variants can be further subdivided depending on the ecology of the species, but we won't go there, and it's not so often done anyway. So here's the big idea then. The traits heritability, and this is a technical term in this um, context, it's the fraction of the total phenotypic variation, that is of the entire enchilada, that is additive genetic, okay? It's, it's, and that's why we have to do this subdivision of the genetic variants, is that the heritability that explains the resemblance of parents and offspring and that predicts the response of the population to selection on our trait um, is the fraction of the total observed um, at the end of the day, outward um, phenotypic variation that is the additive genetic component. So it's the fraction of VP that is this first of the genetic components. That's the idea in a nutshell, and in the next two lectures, we will unpack it. Okay, nice theory. Let's pull back a little bit and ask, is it true? Um, the classic tests come from breeding experiments, and here's East's um, flower height in the Koshiana experiment itself, the real thing. He published it in 1916, so yes, it was more than a century ago. Um, and he did what we explained across these pure breeding lines of tobacco that differed in Corolla height. The F1s were indeed intermediate between the two parents, but um, not significantly more variable than the parental lines. It, this distribution may look to your eye a little bit more variable than it is, but it's not significantly more variable than the parents. 
Um, the F2s were also intermediate, but more variable and significantly so, as we would expect, because they're segregating um, for whatever um, the genotypes were that were contributing to flower height. What East then did was breed selectively from the smallest and largest flowered F2, F3, and F4 generation individuals, trying to reconstitute the parental lines. That was the idea that he had in this you know, second decade after the rediscovery of Mendel. Um, and he did, as you can see from this figure, um, substantially, if not perfectly, um, succeed in just five generations um, in reconstituting a short flowered line that was a lot like the original parent. The tall flowered line seems a bit more variable than the original parent, but clearly he was getting there. Um, the implications are that many polymorphic loci do contribute to corolla length in um, this uh, sp species of tobacco. If it was only just a very small handful, he would have succeeded right away in reconstructing the genotypes of both parents, but he hadn't yet after trying for five generations to do so. And it's also um, an implication of this experiment that there is environmentally induced variation even among the genetically identical um, parental plants, right? These have no um, genetic variation component to speak of because they're thoroughly inbred, and yet they too are somewhat variable in flower height. Um, so um, what are the sources of variance in each of these generations? This is a little uh, mental exercise uh, for you to go through. Um, genetic environmental or both? Um, this was a clicker question. Maybe we'll turn this into a quiz question this year. Um, uh, parent 1, parent 2, um, the F1, the F2, and so on. Um, do they have genetic contributions or environmental contributions? Well, we've just um, said they all have environmental contributions. Um, but the interesting question has to do with the F1s and the F2s, whether they have um, genetic variation or not. Anyway, we've come to the end of this breathless introduction to quantitative traits. Um, we'll press on um, next time, um, getting under the hood and uh, seeing how we can estimate the um, components quantitatively and then um, how we can predict um, the direction of and extent of evolution under the force of selection, either in an agricultural breeding context or out in nature. Bye.